sometimes we let certain ideas and perspectives, we let very narrowed imaginations of what's possible, we let bad stories about God oppose the work that God actually wants to do in us and around us. Last week, we hit a major turning point in the Gospel of Mark. Today, we find ourselves, in some sense, spun right back around. And today, we need to talk about the hard right turn, self-disclosure, the Son of Man, and the problem with Satan. But today is going to be a bit of a heavy one, because right here on the edge of Palm Sunday, Jesus is going to predict his own death for the first of three times on his way to Jerusalem. But we start right where we left off last week. And if you remember, Jesus has just built to this climactic moment, the pivotal turning point in the narrative. He turns to his friends and he asks, who do you say I am? To which Peter responds, you are the Messiah. And this is the first time anyone has voiced this hope anywhere in the gospel, and that's great, probably felt like a real moment for Peter. Like, I bet he was quite proud to be the one who finally said what all the disciples had been thinking, and why wouldn't he? Good for him. Take your moment, Peter. Take a bow. You've earned it. Accept. Next sentence, verse 31, we read that Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders by the chief priests, and by the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about all of this, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Jesus turned and looked at the disciples. He rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And talk about highs and lows, am I right? Jesus saves all that space, protects this moment for his friend. Peter rises to the occasion and names the hope that everyone has been afraid to voice. I bet Jesus looked him in the eyes, locked eyes, gave him the good old attaboy. Peter's on cloud nine right now. And to be honest, Jesus is probably feeling pretty good himself. And seconds later, it all comes crashing back down. Remember, we talked last week about how Jesus is frustrated that the disciples just, like, they're not getting it. And so he tries a new strategy. He gives them this new metaphor, this man whose vision is cloudy but becomes clear. And it seems for a moment like they are finally on board. You know, setting aside Peter's rise and fall for a moment here, probably felt like a big relief for Jesus too, right? I mean, he's been waiting for his friends to really see him. And he hasn't wanted to tell them what to believe about him. He's been very patient in letting them come to their own realization, showing rather than telling, you might say. But here, now that they have, it's almost like Jesus now pours out everything he's been holding back. I mean, imagine you're Jesus, and you've been wanting your friends to have their own space, to come to their own conclusions, but somewhere in the background, well you've come to some conclusions of your own. And you're starting to understand where you think the story is heading and what you will have to endure, what you are honestly probably most terrified about. And so when they open up, so do you. And you tell them about what you see on the horizon and you let them in on your fears about where the story is headed. You tell them what must happen and they respond for lack of a better translation with, oh Jesus, don't be so dramatic. <laughs> like, There's a lot going on here in this moment. First, I can see why Peter doesn't want to hear this, right? I mean, he's been waiting all this time just to say what he's just said. It's a moment of celebration for him and Here's Jesus reigning on his own parade. Have you ever tried to offer someone like a really deep, heartfelt compliment and they shrug it off with, ah, you don't know what you're talking about? Well, imagine telling someone you think they're the Messiah you've been waiting for and they respond with, yeah, but I'm going to die anyway, so whatevs. (laughs) Now, sure, I mean, Jesus talks about his resurrection here, but let's be honest, once he tells his friends he's going to die, I bet they checked out. They weren't listening past that. On the other side, though, there's Jesus, and 
He's been holding on to his story, waiting for his friends to understand him and hoping they would reach a point where he could be honest with them about what was ahead. And here, when he thinks they have finally reached that moment, they finally arrived, he opens up and Peter shuts him down with a, don't be so negative, let's look on the bright side of things, JC. You ever found yourself in a relationship where you were very cautious at first? And you opened yourself up very slowly, bit by bit, and it seemed like at every step along the way, they were with you, tracking with you, they understood you. So one day you took the big step and you told them that thing you rarely tell anyone else and when you did, you saw it in their eyes immediately, that glazed over deer in the headlights look, like things just got too real too quick for me, sorry, I'm out of here. Like, could there be a more vulnerable moment? That's where Jesus finds himself now. See, for all the times where it feels like Mark is constructing something very literary, a moment for us, this one honestly feels pretty raw. And so Jesus responds with, well, some raw edge of his own. Get behind me, Satan. Satan. And there's a few things we should talk about here. First, I'm intrigued by how we get to this moment. Uh, Peter calls Jesus the Messiah. Jesus warns his friends not to tell anyone about that. And then we read that Jesus began to teach them about the Son of Man. Now, Son of Man is a phrase that the writer of Mark likes a lot. He saves Messiah for these big revelatory moments, but his preferred title for Jesus is actually Son of Man. Now, the phrase here is uion tu anthropou, and that means Son of Man, or perhaps even better, Son of Humanity. But it's not a genuine Greek phrase. Like, you wouldn't say that in Greek. What this is, is a somewhat clunky translation of an Aramaic phrase that comes from the prophet Daniel, Barnashah. What's interesting, though, is that we actually have a ton of references in all kinds of intertestamental writings all through the Palestinian Galilean region of the time, demonstrating that Barnashah had become, at least by the time of Jesus, a pretty common idiom. A lot of people were using it. And this was not anything like, remotely like a divine title. Lots of people would use this phrase for themselves and anything, it was meant as a term of modesty. A term that identified you with the common people, a son of humanity. In fact, Ched Myers, who, by the way, wrote probably like the book on Mark, a book called Binding the Strongman, be forewarned though, is a very large, very heavy, very academic tome, But he suggests a better translation to get the intent of this Aramaic phrase across would be something more like a human one. And William Lane suggests in his commentary on Mark that Peter's objection to Jesus' prediction is not at all based on the incongruency between the title Son of Man and his impending death. In fact, identifying yourself with the title Son of Man and then predicting your death at the hands of the powerful elites That's exactly the kind of usage you would expect from a title like Son of Man. So no, Peter's objection isn't that the Son of Man might die, it's that the Messiah can't possibly be just a Son of Man. And I get that. Like, who wants their hero to be just a human one? We want our heroes to be more than that. My kids watch Paw Patrol. Yours do too. Don't tell me they don't. (laughs) But it's a show about talking dogs who drive cars and save towns. And yet somehow in the new season, that's not enough because now they all have superpowers too. Like nothing is ever enough for us. Even talking dogs, there's always got to be more than that. Jesus, though, I think is doing something very important here. Because it seems obvious to me, at least, that Jesus is very intentionally challenging his disciples' conception of Messiah that's gotten a little too big for itself. And he wants to bring it back down. Like, he avoided that word all through the Gospels, but here I think it's fair to say he's invited it from them. He certainly doesn't deny their claim, and yet immediately he begins to qualify it. 
Peter calls him Messiah. Jesus accepts that title, but immediately begins to teach them about the human one. That same common title that he's been using through the Gospels thus far to talk about himself. Now, granted, he said things like this. I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, Mark 2.10. Or the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath, Mark 2, 28. Or the Son of Man must suffer many things here in Mark 8, verse 3. But Jesus is using this common title to proclaim some fairly uncommon things about himself. And in particular, Jesus seems to be reaching back to the origins of this term that come from the prophet Daniel. And there in Chapter 7, we read that in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, a human one, coming from the clouds of heaven. And he approached the ancient of days and was led into God's presence. And he was given authority and glory and sovereign power, and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom, one that will never be destroyed. What's important here is that you can see already in the Jewish story, there was a latent imagination of a human one, one who would come from God and establish God's justice in the world. This passage was, by the time of Jesus, understood as a messianic prophecy. But over time, people had started to downplay the earthiness, the humanness of Messiah and lean more into the clouds, the power of Messiah. In some sense, that human one had become something more than just that, somehow like the Paw Patrol, but now with superpowers. And Jesus seems to kind of want to bring it all back down to earth. Not to the diminishment of what it meant to be Messiah or Son of God. No, Jesus says he can forgive sins. Jesus says he is Lord over Sabbath. But Jesus also says he can suffer and he can be hurt He can be killed. He can become the victim of our militaristic ideologies. In fact, perhaps it is our militaristic fantasies about Messiah that in the end will end him. See, the justice of God, the dominion of heaven comes from the ground up. From the one who shows us how to be human. And yet somehow, consistently, we seem to want to invert that story. It's if we want God's will imposed on us rather than birthed within us. And so Jesus, by returning to son of man language, is not rejecting Paul's messianic declaration. This is a calculated refocusing of his friend's imagination, a return to what the story was perhaps always meant to be. To which his friends say, nah. And I think with all of that in mind, you can start to see why Jesus reacts so strongly here, right? For a moment, he's felt seen. For a moment, he has felt understood. And he's unloaded his fears to his friends in an attempt to turn the story back toward its origin. And well-meaning as he is, Peter throws it back in his face. Mark tells us that he took Jesus aside and rebuked him. This week, on Friday actually, we were having a little trouble with our morning routine. And my daughter, who is four, got it in her head. She was like not going to preschool on this particular day. And she had a bit of a meltdown with Rachel while Rachel was trying to get everyone out the door. And so in the end, it was decided that rather than drag her kicking and screaming to the car, Rachel would take our son to school, while Daddy and Emerson would take a little time to compose ourselves before heading out for the day. And so I let her crawl into bed with me under the covers, nice and comfy and warm so we could all calm down. And she stopped crying and started giggling. And after a few minutes, I said to her, okay, baby, I'm glad you're feeling better, but it's time to go to school. Let's get ready. To which she said, Daddy, I'm taking a break right now. It's time to be quiet. And I tell you, the irony of that phrase was I could barely hear it because she had perforated an eardrum like five minutes earlier with her screaming. And I'm going to be honest here, I didn't love the rebuke either, okay? 
Jesus, we're kind of having a moment here. Can you not? It's a pretty strong word that Mark uses here. It's the same word for how Jesus responds back to Peter, but it also seems Mark has been seeding this. It's the same word that was used in chapter one for when Jesus silences demons. It's the same word that's used in chapter three for when Jesus silences the wind. It's a little shocking here to see Peter try to silence Jesus. As an aside, please try not to do that to each other, right? Like when someone opens up to you, even if it catches you off guard a little bit, try not to let your surprise overrule their vulnerability. That's a gift. Treat it as sacred. But I do think that this misplaced boldness underlines just how disorienting Jesus' words were for Peter. See, as Christians, we often read what we know about Jesus now back into the Hebrew Scriptures. There's a famous passage in Isaiah 53. We sometimes call it the Song of the Suffering Servant. We read this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought peace was on him. And for Christians, we read that and we're like, obviously, that's talking about Jesus. I mean, why couldn't Peter expect this story for his Messiah? But that's not at all how Jewish people understood that song. Uh, we know from the Isaiah Targums that were discovered with the Dead Sea Scrolls that Jewish teachers of the day understood that there were two characters at play in Psalm 53. One that represented the saving work of God, the other representing the long-suffering nation that waited for God's saving. None of our later Christian interpretations were obvious to anyone at the time. They are post hoc renegotiations. And that's okay. We interpret and we reinterpret things all the time as new information arises. But it also means I get Jesus' frustration with his disciples. And at the same time, I very much, I get Peter's inability to even entertain Jesus' predictions. This is a complex moment for both of them. This is, as I said last week, the major turning point in Mark's narrative. Everything turns from here. But there's one more thing I want you to notice on this verge of Holy Week. Peter takes Jesus aside, away from the disciples to rebuke him. Peter turns away from Peter, back toward the disciples, and rebukes Peter by saying, get behind me, Satan. Now, Satan is an interesting term here. It's okay if you think devil, but that's not necessarily what's going on in Jesus' mind. Throughout most of the Hebrew scriptures, Satan or Hasatan was not necessarily a person or a being. It's better to think of it more like a title. So the adversary, or the one who opposes, the accuser is a good translation of Hasatan. There's even a passage in the book of Numbers where God opposes a man named Balaam, and the Hebrew literally says that Yahweh stood in his way as an adversary, literally his Satan. Now, it's also true that by the time of the New Testament, a lot of Hebrew ideas are getting mixed in with Greek ideas, and Hasatan was being used to translate the Greek word diablos, or devil. And you get this Satan-devil character that emerges, and that lines up with some of the ways that Hasatan is used in the Hebrew scriptures. You just need to know that every time Hasatan appears, it's not necessarily being used to talk about a personified devil. It might also just be used in the normal sense of an adversary. Here, I think Jesus is doing something pretty unique with that interplay. Remember, it's Peter that takes Jesus away from the group. It's Jesus that turns away from Peter back toward the group. And so when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, Peter is, for all intents and purposes, already safely behind Jesus, right? What I think is going on here is not that Jesus is talking to some devil 
It's certainly not that Jesus is calling Peter the devil. I don't even think Jesus is calling Peter his adversary. I think it's that Jesus is using this personified sense of Hasatan that's floating around in the popular imagination to say that sometimes we let certain ideas and perspectives, we let very narrowed imaginations of what's possible, we let bad stories about God (coughs) oppose the work that God actually wants to do in us and around us. But Jesus also knows very well that that misunderstanding, that's not Peter. Peter is not Jesus' enemy. Peter is not Jesus' adversary. Peter is Jesus' friend. And so what Jesus does is he puts his friend safely behind him and he turns his attention to this triumphalist imagination of Messiah a story that he knows is absolutely opposed to the lowly way of grace and peace that's ahead of him. And he demands that that imagination of the divine, that conquering, trampling, victory at all costs image of God, that picture of the Messiah, that get behind him as well. See, what Jesus knows is that his adversary is not people. Not even people who see the world differently than him. No, those are the beloved children of God that he is here to save. And Jesus will not allow himself to be confused about that because Jesus knows that his adversary is violence and power and coercion and manipulation. Jesus' adversary is victory that looks like the conquering might of Rome. And for the human one to turn his attention toward Jerusalem, he needs to put that story of power at all costs firmly behind him. And that's what he does here. Here's what I want you to know today. There are ideas and there are ideologies, there are aspirations that all of us need to learn to let go of in order to follow the way of peace. But Jesus will never confuse you with the unhelpful ideas that you carry, with the mistakes that you make, with the times that you fall, because those are not you any more than Peter was his misconceptions of Jesus here in this moment. And the goodness of God is the grace that comes to find us even in our bad stories about God and slowly invite us to embrace better ones. So on this verge of Holy Week, may we all begin to let go of our ideas about Jesus that oppose the way of the cross and instead embrace the human one that shows us the incredible power of self-giving love. Victory won through sacrifice that can never be undone. Hey, Jeremy here, and thank you for clicking through to watch that video. If you're intrigued by the work that we're doing here at Commons, you can, of course, hit subscribe to keep up to date with all of the content that we're posting here on YouTube. You can head to our website at commons.church, and you can find us on all of the socials at Commons Church. You can also join our Discord. There, the community is having all kinds of conversations about how we can encourage each other in the way of Jesus. Head to commons.church slash discord for the invite there. Also, leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you and all the ways that you are journeying on this path toward Jesus. But thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all the ways that you contribute to this conversation together. We'll see you soon.